It's episode 58 of the Social Restaurant Podcast. This week, we're talking about servant leadership. Stay tuned. It's the restaurant industry's most popular show on how social media, mobile, and other disruptive technologies are changing the way your customers think, act, and interact with your restaurants online. Each week, we talk with some of the best and brightest minds in the restaurant business, from owners and operators to chefs, marketers, and their technology partners. Welcome to the Social Restaurant Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode number 58 of the Social Restaurant Podcast. As always, I am Nate Riggs, still your host of this show. They haven't kicked me off yet. Uh, Last week, we had a great show. We had the pleasure of talking with Lisa Ingram, the president of White Castle, a very well-known and traditional brand in Columbus, Ohio, about how they stay fresh, how they innovate in front of this new era of customers. This week, we are, again, recording live in the NR Media Group studio, and we are going to be discussing customer service and the idea of servant leadership in the restaurant industry. Our guest has maintained a successful restaurant for over 30 years using great servant leadership and, of course, delicious food. I do want to mention that NR Media Group is planning a new production that's going to be live every Friday, 8 a.m., starting in 2015. That is in January, coming up. And this is called the Columbus Marketing Show. We're going to be conducting interviews with Central Ohio's most innovative marketing leaders, from small businesses to big companies, it's going to be recorded again live here at the NR Media Group studios, and you're going to want to definitely check out that show. At NR Media Group, we are digital media engineers. We change the way that businesses understand and use digital media to connect with customers, earn their trust, and win their business for life. You can learn more about us at nrmedia.biz. But I do want to get to this week's content, which I think is very interesting. A Harvard Business School case study uh, has a lot of research on the tremendous impact of customer service and profitability. Some of the stats from this study are that the satisfied customer visits about visits any location about 4.3 times per month and stays a customer for about four and a half years. The highly satisfied customer visits about 7.2 times per month and actually will stay a customer of that brand for nearly double, 8.3 years. A total satisfied customer is worth about $921.78 over the span of their 4.4 year customer life. And this really is a testament to go to show that the amount of focus that you put on service is really going to impact profitability and impact how you're going to be able to grow your business. Our guest today is an expert at servant leadership and really driving customer service through the the brand. Uh, She is a local Columbus entrepreneur who began working in the restaurant industry uh, almost 40 years ago. 30. 30 years ago. Don't age me. Be careful with that one. Almost 30 years ago, uh, and she created Katzinger's Delicatessen. She is the champion of crafting top-notch customer service using servant leadership and, of course, great food. Before we get to all that, we want to get to Restaurant News of the Week. Take us away, Melissa. All right, Nate. This week, we're talking a little bit about menu labeling regulations that have just come down the pipeline from the Food and Drug Administration. Um, This is going to make chain restaurants with 20 or more locations list their calorie information on their menus. So not just menus, but menu boards and um, drive-through menus as well. So not everything is going to be required on there. We don't have to have the saturated fat and sodium and so forth, but you will be able to see exactly how many calories are in your sandwich. Uh, This is going to be a hot topic for restaurants coming up. They have one year to comply, and that is a lot of work. And all the consultants and marketing agencies everywhere started to rejoice because that's a big change for a lot of restaurants to roll, especially if you're a chain system, to roll out new menu boards and, and menus and add all of this information. Does does this new legislation apply to uh, segments across the board or is it only for restaurants that have sit down regular table menus or menu boards as well? It's going to be almost everybody. Um, you're going to have your sit-down restaurants, drive through restaurants, even bars that have menus on there. If they have 20 or more locations, they're going to be asked to comply as well. Your muffin at Starbucks, things like that, everything's got to have the calories on it these days. And now that's calories are just going to be kind of forward-facing on the menu, but what other information does the restaurant or the operators need to kind of keep it on hand. They will also have to have the information about (laughs) trans fat, saturated fat, sodium, all of that information, protein, will also have to be available to the consumer in written form upon request. It's very interesting. Diane, as an operator, what what does this menu labeling mean to you? Obviously, it's not going to affect you guys. You don't have 20 locations, but 
in your mind, how does this change things for, for operators? Well, it's, it's interesting because we've actually been confronted with a situation where we've had catering customers specifically ask us for, for menu, and we said, we, we're, we're little. It's really, really expensive to get this information accurately. They certainly wouldn't give it out if it wasn't accurate. Um, so it's a huge expense. We have a huge menu. And even though the menu is sort of variations on the theme, nonetheless, it's 40-some sandwiches, no, 50-some sandwiches, and then plus our salads, et cetera. It's extremely expensive. And there's this part of me who, you know, socially, I'm, I'm a very liberal person. I believe in all kinds of causes, blah, 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 blah. I'm good with the government. I like the government. Lower roads, I'm big on roads. But I think that there's responsibility for people to take, take pride in themselves if they're interested in how much they're consuming, that information is out there, maybe not specifically of this corned beef sandwich, but you gotta know if it's deep fried, it's gonna be more calories. It's that kind of stuff. So it's sort of surprising to me that people aren't taking more, more responsibility for themselves when it comes to this specifically. I mean, you bring up an interesting point. Is it the government's job to force calorie information down our throats, or is it on the responsibility of each individual person to figure out you know, what they wanna put the effort in and go out and research? I'm at the deli every day. I've been the same weight my entire adult life, which is in my 60s now. I'm on my treadmill every day also, and I watch what I eat. And I'm around all that luscious, incredible pastrami and corned beef, and it's so fabulous. I'll take a bite of that, and then I'll have a little bit of grilled chicken for lunch. Especially getting in time into this time of the year, it becomes a challenge right. for everybody to really kind of stay on that course. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice that you just heard was Diane Warren, from Katzinger's Delicatessen, and the founder of Katzinger's. Diane graduated from the Ohio State University with a BA in history. <laughs> and before entering the food service industry in 1974, she was a clerk and legal assistant for the American Civil Liberties Union. But in 1984, you founded Katzinger's Delicatessen. Why make that move? Why, why completely 180 and go into the restaurant industry? Uh well, what happened was, is when I, long story short, when I, when I quit the ACLU, I couldn't find a job, and somebody came to me, as a friend of mine said to me, I'm, I'm waiting tables at this really new, at this restaurant, it's really great, I'm making $100 a day, why don't you try it? Never occurred to me, I was 27, old to go into restaurants. And I tried it and found out that if you give them their food hot and their drinks cold and you smile and you give them good service, they like you and they give you money. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And Eureka. Yeah, it was a Eureka moment. It was like, I never really thought of it like that. And it was great. And that's how I ended up in restaurants. So you, you've been in operations now for more than 30 years. And Katzinger's is both a specialty food shop as well as a restaurant, a delicatessen. Tell us a little bit about the evolution of the brand and, and who you guys are. Well, when, I, when we first opened Casting, it was myself and my husband at the time, and we were, we were partners on the business. He had much more restaurant experience than I did. I had sort of front of the house kind of waiting tables, hostessing, bartending, that sort of thing. He was great. We wanted to do something that was like really like a typical New York kind of deli in Columbus in 1984. 1984, long time ago. But we thought we'd also do these specialty foods. We'd do these wonderful goat cheeses and extra virgin olive oil and balsamic vinegar, which were things that we were just learning about. And people were really put off by that. I mean, I would go around with samples of this fabulous goat cheese and they go, oh, I could never eat anything from goats. Now everybody eats goat cheese. And everybody knows extra virgin olive oil. Everybody knows balsamic vinegar. But at the time, it was an education of the customer that was an incredibly difficult experience. What we wanted to do was something that was not it was not a sandwich shop, and people in Columbus sort of thought delis were sandwich shops, and you could get bologna with mayonnaise on white bread, and wouldn't that be great? I'm like, no, that's not what we want. We want the best corned beef. We want the best bread that we can get. It doesn't have to be from Columbus. The best bread we could find was from Detroit, which was great. Um, the best pastrami, the best foods, in addition to those, work with these other specialty kinds of foods that are very unfamiliar to the Columbus market. Now, one of the interesting things that we, we found in an article is that Katzinger's dishes out literally two and a half tons of corned beef and 122 five-gallon pails of pickles each month. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that a testament to the, the type of palate that you've created in your customers? Tell me a little bit about how you manage all that and, and really what is that? You don't think of corned beef selling like 
hotcakes, if you will. You know, I think it's actually a testament to the quality of the product. This is corned beef that you, you've not had before. If you were getting your corned beef at Kroger's, you have not tasted corned beef. This is incredibly delicious product. So it's a testament not just to the palate of the customer, but also to the quality of the product, which is, which is so important because I think a lot of people in this country don't understand that if it tastes better, it's probably because it's made with, integ with the integrity of what the product is capable of. You can get a lot of, we, I don't want to, you know, I'm not really trying to be disrespectful of anything, but there's a lot of bad food out there. There's a lot of food that's not handled with care. There's a lot of industrial food. All of the products that we serve are handmade in some way. Um, they're not machine-made stuff, and it's like you, it's like, you know, when you're a little kid and your mom made cookies, like, these are better than the ones in the package because they're made with love. And there's, and there's something kind of silly about that, but in fact, there is something about the integrity of how you respect your product that transfers to the palate. I don't know what that's about. There's some kind of psychological weird thing, I think. I don't know what it is, but in fact... You do know. You do. People do know the difference. The other thing about the pickles, though, the cool thing about the pickles, the way we do them at Kassinger's, is that we let you help yourself from a pickle barrel, and it's so cool. It's really a cool thing. It is one of the first things that you do, and, yeah. and being a, a frequent Katzinger's customer, you go in and you order, and you grab your pickle, and, and even my kids love doing it. They think it's really cool <laughs> right. that they get to pick their, their pickle out of the barrel. Uh, you talk a lot about the integrity of your food, and obviously this is resonating. So this little deli in Columbus, Ohio, has drawn celebrity guests from everybody from the Rolling Stones to Bill Clinton. How do you do it? What, well, what, I have to be what, fair about the Rolling Stones. They actually were not at the deli. They ordered out 99 sandwiches. <laughs> it was after one of their shows. And, yeah, so they weren't at the deli. But they had somebody from their staff had been through the deli and went, this is a great place. Let's get food from them. So th this is all word of mouth, and that's getting you in, in front of it. these, well, these guests. Well, Bill Clinton was different. Bill Clinton, this is a little funny story. Bill Clinton, um, I was really active in health care reform, and um, President Clinton was coming to Columbus. This was back in 1994. He was coming to Columbus for a crime prevention thing, actually in London, Ohio. And the person I was working with at the, the, at the Democratic Party called me, and he said, um, the president's going to be in town. He's doing a meet and greet at the airport. Would you like to come? And I said, well, how many people are going to be there? And he said, about 200. And I said, no, just bring him to the deli. I just fell out of my mouth. And he went, great idea. And that's how that happened, which taught me all you got to do is ask. The worst I can do is say no. So yeah. that was my, per as a business person, that was my first really big punch in the face of all you got to do is ask. And I have used that many times since then, successfully, yeah. right? And obviously he, he enjoyed the food. I saw the picture up on the wall. Yeah, he so. did. He was there for 45 minutes. We sat down and had lunch and talked about health care insurance, universal health care, the possibility of it, that sort of stuff. Of course, this was a long time ago, but finally we have it. So well, there you go. Yep, there you go. So you guys are now expanding a little bit. Uh, you have Cat Singers in the North Market. Tell me a little bit about this new concept and, and where are you going with, with kind of this new evolution of Cat Singers? Uh, that's a really great question. Cat Singers Little Deli in the North Market is um, a miniature Cat Singers. If you've not been to Cat Singers, Cat Singers is... It's big, it's voluptuous, it's got lots of stuff going on, there's lots of artwork there, there's many, many items on the sandwich, I have 50 some I think, I don't even know how many exactly, there's lots of prepared foods that we offer, salads and side dishes, homemade desserts, we've got wonderful cheeses and olive oils and all of the other stuff that I've been talking about. The Little Deli, 10 of our best selling sandwiches, five side dishes, three brownies, pickles from the barrel, that's it. So it's simplified, and what we're finding out is that a lot of our customers like that because they come in and they don't have to sort through all of these sandwiches to find what they want. They've got a limited choice. Everything's going to be terrific. They can make their own if they want, which is fine with us too, but it still sort of simplifies that experience in a different way. Um, it's very efficient. It's um, a lot of fun. We have a lot of opportunity to interact with our customers there, and it's much Faster. We order that sandwich and we will have it to you in two, even if it's grilled, we'll have it to you in two minutes. So it's a whole different kind of experience. And we're taking that and looking at ways that we can redo the Katzinger's in German Village and make it more efficient as well. So we're learning a lot from this experience. It was just an experiment. 
We you, had the opportunity, so we took advantage of it. You guys focus on local produce and or, or, or a lot of like integrity in the ingredients of the food that you use. You have table service. You bring the food out to the table or, or people pick it up. Well, we, we do not have table service. Don't order at the table. You order at the counter. Most of our produce during the summer is local, but during the winter it is, isn't because, yeah. you know, it's the stuff that we use. Um, we get our corned beef from Detroit through Vienna, <coughs> pardon me, in Cleveland. We get our bread from Pittsburgh. We're, even though I have great respect for the, the sort of local movement, it is not, we cannot get the quality of the product that we use in Columbus. Um, at this time, there may be a time in the future and we look for it and we do talk with people about it, but at this time we have not. And also the volume that we do, yeah. we've not been able to get that locally. And I'm okay with getting it someplace else because it's a great product and I respect the people who manufacture the product. That being said, corn beef comes in once a week, so it's not a whole lot of traffic flow with that. Bread comes in, the bread, the bread does come in daily um, from Mediterra Bakery, and they do deliver to other places in Columbus as well. Well, where I was going is, do you, do you guys yeah. consider yourself, the big boom right now in the restaurant industry is mm -hmm. this fast casual trend, and, and really, there's a lot of muddy waters as to what defines a fast casual restaurant. Do you consider yourself a fast casual restaurant? You know, we are a fast casual restaurant, by the way it's defined, you order at the counter, we do deliver your food to you. Um, but the thing that Kassinger's does a little bit differently is we try very hard and we train our staff, we work with our staff from the very beginning to establish personal relationships with our customers. So one of the things that we do to indicate that is when you place your order, we ask for your name. We don't put a number on the table, we ask for your name. And that's the most important, that's the sweetest sound is the sound of your name from a loved one's lip. Well, we're loving you guys, <laughs> and we want to know your name, and we want to be able to talk with you if we have the opportunity, and we want you to come back because we're going to ask for your name again. We know you're a person, you're not a number. Diane, I want to switch gears for one second uh, to, to really focus on this idea of servant leadership. So... One of the things that we've read that you said that I think is really interesting is that we live in a self-service world. Explain what do you mean. What do you mean by that? You know, when we opened the deli 30 years ago, and and uh, we're then remember this is 30 years ago when bagels weren't everywhere. <laughs> okay, now here's Casagers. We come in and we want to serve this great product. We want to do it in a different kind of way. We also want to serve a lot of Jewish specialty food. Bagels and blintzes and kugel and potato knishes and things that some people had never heard of. And we wanted to give great service. So we realized we needed to train our staffs about the quality and, and the different kinds of foods that we wanted to serve, but also about how to serve them, how to treat our customers. And what I realized then was that we were now on the second generation of what I used to call the Kmart McDonald's generation. We have a group of people in their late teens and early 20s They've never really experienced service. They've never been to a shoe store where somebody sat down with them and measured their foot. They've never been to a, a clothing store where a server, a service person, helped them choose the clothes and came back to say, does this fit right? How about in blue? Would you like to try to see that in red? They had never had that experience, which was shocking to me because that was part of my DNA. I grew up with that. So then I thought, okay, now we're going to have to teach them about something that they're totally unfamiliar with. So totally unfamiliar with knishes and latkes, that I get. You can taste that and understand it. They're totally unfamiliar about how we treat our guests. And it was a shocking thing for me to, to come up with that realization. And so starting from the very beginning, we had to start working with our, 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 our service people about how we treat our guests. And that was the very beginning. So, so how do you define servant leadership? Well, servant leadership is how, as leaders, we serve our staff. Because at the end of the day, they are more important to us than we are to them. They can go down the street and get another job. But this is my livelihood. This is what I do for a living. This is my love. And I can't walk down the street and open up another deli, restaurant, whatever. So consequently, 
I have to serve them, and I, and I don't have to, I choose to serve them with the respect that they deserve because they work really hard and they make me look good. So, so, so they deserve this. You know, this is something that I do because they have the willingness and the desire to help me fulfill my dream. So this is an internally focused kind of paradigm. This yes. is really towards the people that are working for you yes. in your restaurant. And then I, I'm assuming that the hope is, is that that same level of leadership and, and uh, the ability to serve others then translates out to your customers as well. And it's, the interesting thing is that it does. I, if, I think that if you work with people that give service in, in whatever it's a restaurant or a shoe store or hospital or dentist office or wherever they work, if they give service for a living, they beget service. It, it, it's a cyclical kind of thing because you're creating a paradigm in which people are good to each other, are respectful of each other, but in addition to that, they are looking out for what they can do to make this experience a good one for them. So you know, I'll talk to you, this is kind of an off the wall story, but I'm gonna give it to you. I had cancer several years ago. And I would go to see my oncologist, and one day I was sitting in the office making an appointment for my next, my next meeting, and the, the nurse came in and she said, I need to know the correct pronunciation of this woman's name. She's coming in, this is her first time to visit us, she's very frightened, she has a scary cancer, and the worst thing I can do is pronounce her name wrong. And I was so stunned by that. I said, I will never leave this doctor. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. But it, but it was such a... It was such a kind of interesting thing of this is the kinds of things that people need to know that we will protect for them. We will, we, will, we will call your name instead of giving you a number. We will smile when we see you. We will want to give you exactly what you want. We're going to find out what it is. We will give it to you as graciously as we possibly can. We will thank you for coming in. You've made our day. That's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Boy, I hadn't thought about that story for a long time. It's a great story, and, and I, you know, one of the things I've written down is, is you kind of have these tenets of, of what the servant leader is. So the servant yeah. leader will be authentic, vulnerable, accepting, present, and useful. Yes, yeah. And all of those things in that story you've just described, but the question I have is, are these the core values of, of Katzinger's as an organization, or is this just personal to you and your leadership team? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, I think they're the core value of our leadership team by intrinsically because this is who the people this is who they are and we encourage that and we celebrate that and we try to make it beneficial for them to be authentic and vulnerable and certainly useful <laughs> but they come in with that it, you know it's interesting because they can't they come in being those kinds of people but it, you don't know it. You don't look at yourself and go, am I vulnerable enough? Am I useful enough? It, but as you work with it, not thinking about it in those words, but as you, as you work with the philosophy of respecting your staff and respecting your quality of your product and respecting your guests, it becomes part of you. Just like I grew up with this kind of DNA, it becomes sort of part of who you are. And how you benefit in the rest of your life outside of the deli has, ha, is impacted by this, this new sense of self that you have. It's very interesting. I mean, so on one end, you've talked about servant leadership as the philosophy. Why, why do we do this and what is this? And then on one side, it's the methodology, the how. You know, what are the things that we can do smiling at our customers, addressing people by their names? What is the playbook then? How do you put this into action from a training perspective? Because not everybody grew up with the same experience right. that you had, and so others need to be brought into the fold. Talk to me a little bit about how that plays out. Right. Well, we start talking about service and orientation. Um, Eric Dennison, my general manager, um, does most of our orientations along with Michelle Johnson, who's also, Michelle, Michelle, Eric's been with us for seven years, Michelle's been with me for 14, fabulous, almost half the life of the deli. Um, and they start off at the very beginning about the importance of service, the importance of respect, the importance of, of willingness, um, and the rewards that you get from it. And 
Somewhere in the next 60 days, we get together as um, a staff. Some of it is redoing, because we revisit this, and some of it is just for the first time for new staff. And we go through um, about an hour to an hour and a half long sort of seminar with examples and, and of real experiences of service and what it looks like, what it feels like, the impacts, and what the rewards are. There's incredible rewards for giving great service. Service got, got a bad name somewhere in our society. You know, it was, service was like sales. And it was like that old kind of like insurance salesman or a used car salesman kind of thing. And that's not what this is. We're, it's not sales, it's educating. So we're educating each other, we're educating our guests about our product, um, and we're educating them about our willingness to do what we can to make this a great experience for them. Well, it's obvious that the experiences that you're creating for your guests are working. Katzinger's is a long-standing deli in, in Columbus with, I would argue, a, a raving fan base, me being one of them. And, you know, what you've talked about today absolutely kind of exhibits the values that you have. So we, we want to thank you very much for being gracious enough to come in and tell these stories to us. Uh, before we let you go, what's next for Katzinger's in 2015? What are, what are the big things that we should know about? Oh, that's a great question. We actually have some big plans for Kassinger's. We're, get, we're gonna do a Kassinger's rejuvenation. We're gonna be moving some things around internally inside the deli. We're gonna make our sandwich line more efficient. We're going to um, take our specialty food store and make it smaller as well. We're gonna pull out the stuff that doesn't sell. We're gonna really focus on educating our guests about these fabulous foods. We haven't done a very good job of that. Well, I shouldn't say that. We haven't done as good a job as we could have. We're going to be telling the stories behind these fabulous foods, which are great. They're so interesting and they're so fun. Um, and we're also maybe going to do another little deli. We're looking at the possibility of doing that, too. Well, this is all fantastic. We wish you the very best of luck. If you are listening to the show and you are not from the Columbus area, when you come into Columbus uh, on 3rd Street, right at the edge of German Village is Katzinger's Delicatessen. Please stop in. You will stand in line just like the President of the United States. Uh, but you will receive great service when you get up to that counter, as well as some great food. And Diane, we want to thank you very much for being a guest on the and show. I thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have for today. My very special thanks to Miss Diane Warren, the owner of Katzinger's Delicatessen, a great little deli down in German Village on 3rd Street. If you do come to Columbus, give it a check out. You will experience, if anything, amazing customer service as you wait in line for wonderful food. The Social Restaurant Podcast is presented by NR Media Group, engineering business results through digital media. You can like this show on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash social restaurant podcast. That is all one word and if you are into learning about how we produce the show you can download sample chapters from our video engineering playbook and you can find that on nrmedia.biz as always i'm your host nate riggs and i will see you back here next week for another social restaurant podcast just one thing